Greetings guys, Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical Education Technology. Coming at you with a short little video here to help get you ready for some of your CEN preparations. Um, I'm gonna talk about preload and afterload, and I'm doing this as a separate little video you all can watch before the cardiac lecture because I feel we really don't have a lot of time to go through this in depth as much as I'd like to during the cardiac lecture when we do it. I'm still gonna go through it when we do a cardiac lecture. However, I wanna talk about it a little bit separate here and that way, especially like if, if you go to the shock lecture, uh, it jumps right into preload and afterload pretty quick. And if you not had the benefit of seeing the cardiac lecture to hear it, you might be a little at a loss for things. So we're gonna go over that here for the next few minutes and talk about this. And one of the reasons we go through this is because again, teaching these classes, my goal is to get you as prepared as you can be understanding concepts that way you can apply them in different scenarios. So not just teaching um, exam questions, not just teaching you know, specific diseases and signs and symptoms, but understanding the concepts. And important to a lot of our cardiac issues and some of our shock issues as well too, is understanding preload and afterload. One of the things I did in researching this, because I'm no ICU nurse, you know, I'm just an ER guy, we just need to keep it simple, right? One of the things I found is there's a lot of inconsistencies in how people are explaining preload and afterload. I've pulled some videos on YouTube, some of the educators' materials, and I still was really kind of confused. I even looked at some of the ENA materials, like the Sheehy's Emergency Manual of Nursing, as well as uh, the Emergency Nursing Core Curriculum. It was still kind of vague and not really clear what we're looking for there. And I really felt it could be made a lot more simple to understand. So this is what I'm gonna give you the simple version, the down and dirty, what you need to know. We're not shooting wedge pressures in the ER. We're not inserting swans. We're not checking PA pressures, things like that. We don't need that. We need to understand how the heart as a pump works and how we can adjust it or boost it depending on what the pathology or what the problem with the heart is and where its pump is having an issue. Okay, so the, let's talk about preload and afterload. There's only one slide for this show, so there's not a lot for this. And this is a slide. Feel free to screenshot this if you want and save it for your study files or whatever. But it's got all the talking points I want to talk about with preload and afterload. And I'm going to really dumb this down to make it really easy to understand. You notice there's not a single number on this screen. We're not going about a single normal pressure. Okay. We can know what's going on with the heart, what its problem is, just by knowing what the condition is, um, whether it's more something that we need to manage the preload or something we need to manage the afterload. Because that's what we're looking at clinically is what do we need to do clinically to boost the cardiac output depending on what their disease or their injury or their condition is. All right. So let's start with preload over on the right side. Now, preload is defined as the amount of stretch of the ventricles at the end of the diastole. So preload is a pressure. I'm sorry. It's, yes, preload is a, I'm sorry, preload is a volume. Because <laughs> it's a volume of stretch. As the right ventricle or the left, as it fills the blood, in this case from the vena cava, right ventricle, or the left ventricle coming in from the, um, pulmonary vein, I'm sorry, coming in from the left atria, as it fills, there's an amount of stretch like a balloon on the ventricle walls. And that filling or that stretch is the preload, okay? That's, it's, it's an amount of stretch, and the more stretch the ventricle has, the better its output is. In any disease state where that stretch is not enough, then there's less output. And that would be too little preload. Oops, I spelled that wrong, preload. So too little preload is when there's not enough volume filling up the ventricles, and so therefore the ejection or the amount out is inadequate. One of the big ones we talk about is the right ventricle. If you have a right ventricular myocardial infarction, part of that right ventricle wall is damaged from the infarct. And so as the blood comes in here and fills it, it's not able to, it can stretch, the blood comes in, but the damaged part of the wall is not able to contract to get the blood out. So they are low on their preload, okay? Because they, don't, they can't get enough tension to generate that pressure. Now, a person who's also hypovolemic from fluid loss also has a low preload because they don't have enough blood in their system to come in through the vena cava and into the ventricle to stretch it. Okay, so too little preload has to do with how much volume or how much fluid is coming in to the ventricle. How do we fix that? Well, it's a volume problem. You give fluids. 
So, and that's why we talk about in class, our right side MIs or our right ventricle MIs, if they're hypotensive, the treatment is not to put them on a presser, the treatment, because it's, it's a preload problem, the right ventricle is damaged, is to give some fluids, small boluses. We give these small 200, 250 cc boluses, or maybe even less, forcing a little extra fluid in the system to help stretch that ventricle a bit more, which gives it a better ejection. Okay, so that's too little preload. That's someone who's preload deficient. It's either due to a right side MI usually or to a volume problem. They're, they're hypovolemic. Maybe they've lost a bunch of blood. Maybe it's a trauma patient. Okay. Now on the other side of the coin, who has too much preload? Preloads of volume. Who has too much volume? That's typically our CHF patient. So if it's a volume surplus, how do I get rid of the volume? Well, our mainstay of therapy is give them some Lasix, furosemide. How does that get rid of this surplus volume? It takes away some of the excess circulating fluid in the vascular system. It reduces the volume. Other things we can do, morphine. Now, morphine is a pain medicine, it's an opiate. If someone's an acute CHF, it kind of works well as far as having some, um, it reduces some stress and some anxiety and maybe if they're having some chest pain, it works for that. But morphine also has a principle which it's kind of still being debated and there's not conclusive evidence, but morphine has been for a long time considered a bit of a venous dilator. And if you dilate the venous system some, that makes that tank of the, ven the venous system is like a tank, it's holding all your blood. It makes it bigger so the blood pressure goes down. So you're kind of decreasing that volume or that pressure. So morphine is a venodilator. Nitroglycerin also at certain dosages is a venodilator and it also reduces that preload. So too much preload means too much volume. How are we gonna fix that? We're gonna reduce the preload, lay six morphine nitro. Those are your three standard simple go-to agents. All right, let's look at the afterload. So the afterload is the amount of pressure the ventricle has to generate to force the valve open and the blood out to the periphery. Okay, that's, so that's the beginning of systole. And this is closely related to the systemic venous resistance, or I'm sorry, systemic vascular resistance and the mean arterial pressure. It's basically the resistance, okay? How much does this ventricle have to squeeze? What pressure does it need to open the valve and get the blood out, all right? So a person who has too much afterload there's too much resistance to get the blood out and get it functionally circulating to the body. So that's a high blood pressure. This is your person who's having a hypertensive issue, a hypertensive crisis or emergency. So how do we reduce that SVR or that MAP? A vasodilator. Any of our antihypertensive agents will reduce that. And so therefore the heart does not have to generate as much pressure to get the blood out. All right, so who has too little afterload so that's a person who has a very low resistance out there. This person's hypotensive, okay? These are our, commonly our states like our distributive shocks, which we'll talk about in the shock lecture. Distributive shocks are those where something is causing the vascular system to dilate. And when the vascular system dilates, the pressure goes down. We've got three main, three main members of the distributive shock family. Our septic shock, our anaphylactic shock, and our Give me a second. I'm gonna think of the third one in just a minute. I'm doing this video right on the fly right now, so I'm sorry I don't have any notes in front of me. I'm doing this all from the top of my head. But anyways, these, th these oh, I'm sorry, neurogenic shock, neurogenic, septic, and, and um, anaphylactic. All three of those cause a massive vasodilation, and so therefore the blood pressure goes down, the mean arterial pressure. How do we fix those? We put them on a vasopressor. We tighten up those blood vessels. We get those blood vessels out here nice and tight. We get them back down to their normal size. The pressure goes up. It can allow the heart to perfuse itself, especially through the coronaries, as well as the, the end organs. Okay, so summary, <clears throat> excuse me, preload is a volume, has to do with how much stretch at the end of diastole, when the ventricles are full, how much stretch, how much expansion is on that ventricle wall, and that stretch helps augment the cardiac output. If you've got too much preload, you have too much stress. That's a volume problem. That's your CHF person, get rid of the volume. Give a preload reducer like Lasix Morphine Nitro. If you don't have enough preload, means you don't have enough stretch, preload's a volume. How do I give more volume? I give some small frequent IV bolus, IV fluid boluses. Okay. Afterload, think of it as the resistance to the ventricles. 
it's a it's a pressure reading okay too much afterload too much pressure too much blood pressure hypertension to give a vasodilator too little afterload like a distributive type of shock with all this vasodilation we put them on a vasopressor to tighten those vessels up to increase that pressure to allow for a good coronary perfusion as well as our in organ perfusion all right guys that's your preload and afterload in a nutshell there are no numbers here. There are no numbers on the CEN exam. I promise you that. All the questions on the CEN would talk about, here's some type of cardiogenic shock or right side MI. How would you help encourage the cardiac output without compromising it? Where are you, do you need to treat the preload or the afterload? How do you boost preload and how do you reduce preload? How do you boost afterload? How do you reduce afterload? It's really that simple, guys. You notice there's only four, there's only four boxes here. You have too much or not enough too much or not enough. All right. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, if you attend one of the classes we do, one of the classes I do, you're going to hear this again, especially in the cardiac lecture and under the shock lecture. And if you are listening to this before then, you'll be able to tie these pieces together better when we get there. All right, Mark Basel, I'm going to sign off here. I'm going to post this as soon as I can for you guys. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if this kind of made some sense to you, kind of helped tie the pieces together, maybe made it simple for you. I hope. All right. Until then, y'all stay safe and be well.